this button here, start, stop, so I won't crash into, come on, you got to do it. It doesn't want to do it. We'll just say one hour. All right, let's go for it. All right, let's switch over to, I think it's eight. Yeah. All right, so I'm Rob Tiffany. Um, anybody see my session yesterday with SQLite and Azure Mobile? Oh, good, a bunch of you did. All right. So yesterday I kind of just talked about using Azure Mobile Services and this new sync technology we have with uh, SQLite and some change tracking uh, to just take care of one of the things you often need to do when you're building large enterprise solutions, data movement. You know, I need to get something from some back-end system out to my device, and I need to take it offline so I can keep working in the absence of a wireless network. So today I'm going to do the exact same thing, but with just different technology. Because you just need options. or you, I know you can't always make everything work the way I tell you in one scenario. Uh, and so uh, this session is going to be a little bit different. You know, there's a lot of craze lately about the notion of APIs. And anybody who's been a developer their whole life kind of rolls their eyes when they hear someone say, oh, APIs are the new thing. And what they mean is just the latest version of web service or SOA. Instead of SOAP and XML, they're talking about REST and JSON is what they're talking about. And that's now APIs. Imagine that. Uh, but it's good for mobile. Uh, that's how we get things connected. It's one of the easiest ways to do it. And also, in this cross-platform world, you don't want to block any potential endpoints by using proprietary wire protocols, right? And so one thing we know that works with anything is, is REST and JSON. In fact, it works with a web browser. In fact, if you can call it from JavaScript and you don't even need an SDK, that's about as pervasive and as good as it gets. So I'm going to spend time talking about that. Um, so all about web API. And again, I'm always about building large end-to-end -end mobile solutions. And so I'm going to talk about caching with web APIs, because I really feel the need for speed at all times, and so do your customers. Uh, but I'm also going to mix it up. Uh, you know, yesterday I was kind of talking about going into Azure and using SQL Azure. And, uh, uh, and in the past, I've done sessions like this where I talk about using replication to kind of shard out nodes with SQL Server. This time, I thought I'd mix it up. And uh, who's heard about the really cool stuff in SQL Server 2014, in-memory tables? This is a giant game changer. Uh, you know, the, the idea that we're getting things off hard, spinning hard disks, or even SSDs, and let's finally take advantage of 64-bit computing, okay? And, you, and RAM is cheap. So the, biggest, the big announcement of SQL 2014 is bringing in-memory tables to the masses. It's not some weird, strange thing you've got to learn, because there's lots of some new proprietary type of in-memory databases out there. This one is just SQL Server Management Studio, like we all know. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some tweaks. Uh, but I thought it would be important since when we're building mobile solutions, you may have to build stuff for hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of consumers uh, or, or your customers. Um, so keeping things in RAM the whole time, you're going to see a common theme. I'm going to stay in memory at the database. I'm going to use these crazy new native machine code compiled stored procedures that SQL 2014 has. I'm going to cache my web APIs. And then I'm going to consume them from universal apps, uh, kind of like I did yesterday with SQLite. Except this time, I'm going to show you how to do in-memory object collections uh, and then serialize those. So kind of NoSQL looking. So, uh, so anyway, I currently, uh, I, for those of you who weren't here uh, yesterday, I, uh, the group I work in at Microsoft, I'm working with this uh, incubation team. And it's just like you think it is, you know, like an incubator outside you know, with startups, except it's for inside Microsoft. So we incubate new products that we've created, or when we do acquisitions from other companies, to kind of bring them in and, you know, get them going down the right direction. So I get to see lots of stuff, still kind of in the mobile space, right? These days I've been working with uh, our device management products, like Intune, uh, as well as our Internet of Things offerings, our IoT stuff, which uh, we have this thing called Azure Internet System Service, little agent streaming data over service bus into Azure, and then you're going to do some cool stuff with it. So that's a lot of fun. All right, so let's just dive into it. Let's see if the clicker works. Yes. You hear people always talking about being mobile first all the time? I've heard it for a long time, and then on now Satya is always saying mobile first, cloud first, all at the same time. Um, I really find, though, that it's easier if you just think API first. Because when you do anything API first, you don't paint yourself in a corner or Create, cause, you know, block yourself. 
because uh, lots of people will say, hey, we're mobile first. We built these apps for mobile devices, and so we're good to go. But wh what they really did is they built monolithic apps that are hard-coded for a particular platform and a particular wire protocol and a particular everything. So they really didn't do anything. Uh, you know, they built one app for one device. If you instead step back, and you know, we've done this as developers forever, you know, if you always think about, like think about just product development. Lots of times people just race and build a product really fast, and then they find out that customers or partners want extensibility, and people end up bolting on APIs to it after the fact, and it's just a kludge. And so a good lesson has always been, conceive of your product, build the API for your product first, then build your product on top of your API. That's always been a good, great pattern for all software development, wherever you do it. But it's especially important for mobile first world. And so think about just building those APIs, then in any client on any mobile device can consume those APIs and keep that in mind. So that's, that's a good way to think about it. Um, since I'm always mostly focused on enterprise mobility, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the highlights of uh, kind of what I think about a lot of, you know, I, I, I do these executive briefings every week. We have plane loads of CEOs and CIOs flying into Redmond every week, and we have this big building called the Executive Briefing Center, and I talk to them every week uh, about mobility and things like that. And uh, you start to pick up on some certain themes, and they're pretty simple, actually, and it, it's great to kind of give you direction. So um, the first one is, this is really simple, and a lot, I see a lot of products and a lot of systems being built. Really, they don't know how to articulate it, but it's really based on this thing. I need to get data from any of my back-end systems out to any of my devices to empower my workforce. That's really what a whole lot of people want to do in a nutshell, this whole mobility thing. And so they're bending over backwards to find ways to do that. They're building, buying new things off the shelf, or they're trying to modify old stuff to, to be able to get out to devices. Um, and so there's lots of ways to skin that cats. Uh, you know, I've been involved in, um, in the past, you know, you've seen these, uh, packages called mobile enterprise application platform packages from Meet vendors, and now you got mobile backend as a service. People kind of doing their thing, and they're all trying to achieve the same thing: get data from anywhere back out to anywhere. So, uh, so I want that, to. That's kind of the gist of what this whole talk is about. So, what are the problems when you when you do that? Well, when you just say any backend system, that could kind of get kind of crazy, and so you're going to find yourself integrating. With all kinds of back-end systems, they all speak different languages. They all have different proprietary protocols that they communicate over. Some don't have any, you know, some are really lame and use databases or whatever to communicate. Lots of old stuff. One other thing, this is not necessarily wisdom because probably lots of you realize it, but, you know, we always are trying to hopefully be in this new greenfield world of building all the newest, coolest stuff. But the reality is, is customers, big companies, are a lot more conservative than you think they're going to be. Even when the CIO says that he's a hard-charging, game-changing visionary, but the reality is most of them are really just keeping the lights on. And the old systems that they've had for decades, they're really not interested in changing them as much as you think they will. They're, they're just like, ah, it's still working. I'm not going to change it. You know, you see customers running VB6 stuff in a VM somewhere in an isolated vault to keep it alive, you know, because their whole railway system's based on it or whatever, you know. So you're going to have to talk to lots of different back-end systems. Now, here's another problem with these back-end systems. And you'll kind of see a theme here, because these back-end systems, they're the value. That's what these companies use to run their business. But they might be dated. They might, might, they're not designed for the mobile web at all. They're not designed for devices. So they can't talk the right language. And then lots of them weren't designed to scale or to have that performance you know, lots of them were designed, you know, years ago when a, a departmental app, you know, with maybe hundreds of people connecting to it was fine, or maybe even thousands for large systems. You know, as you know, in mobility of devices, you might accidentally get really lucky and have millions of people using your service. And, you know, that could be a good news, bad news thing, because if you're integrating with back-end systems that are not prepared for that onslaught, then you're going to be in big trouble. The whole thing will melt down. So we need to find a way to help a lot of these back-end systems be ready for the mobile web. And then, kind of like I said earlier, use REST APIs to expose those back-end systems to mobile devices via, via a gateway of some kind. So kind of where I'm going to talk now, I'm not going to, you know, this, whole, this works anywhere, this conversation. I'm not just giving an Azure talk 
and how you could do pass to build stuff like this. I'm doing a talk where, you know, this is stuff, you know, if you've got lots of customers that still want to do lots of stuff on premise, this whole solution works on premise. It can work in the cloud. And I'm not going to talk about, you might be familiar, we did an acquisition a while ago of an API management company, and we've integrated that. We've got that in preview in Azure. I'm not really talking about that, but we've got some really cool stuff to, to really manage and help you scale web APIs in a way that, that you can't do out of the box. So I'm not touching on that yet. I'm just going to get to the nuts and bolts. And of course, those apps are going to consume that data from those web APIs, those REST APIs. And they're going to interact with it, and they need to keep working even when they're offline because you don't have ubiquitous wireless networking everywhere. So that's, those are kind of the big things. That's kind of what I'm going to address. Um, so kind of a visual representation might look something like this. You know, I've got all, this, all these back-end systems. It could be hundreds or thousands of different types of things at the top here. And then you see at the bottom, I've got tablets and smartphones and devices. And so the problem we're trying to solve is how do I get all that enterprise data from there down to these devices. And so uh, lots of ways to skin that cat. I'm just going to show you one of the ways today um, using web APIs uh, and, and stuff from our universal apps. Now sometimes, especially as people are buying new things off the shelf, when they have money and they, you know, they're buying something brand new, newer systems are building vertically integrated solutions where you buy the back-end server, its wire protocol is already designed to be efficient over wireless data networks, and they give you the client, and you just buy the whole thing soup to nuts. So in those kind of scenarios, you're good to go, and you don't need to do anything special. I'm just talking about the other 99% of everything that's real, the real life and real world out there that doesn't have that. So we need to mash up all those back-end systems. But like I say, it's not like a consumer app mashup like you may have done in the past, where I'm going to talk to Google here and then pull some stuff from Yahoo here, and I'm going to hit this, and it's going to be cool. Uh, this is very different because this is serious, giant amounts of data and secure in a corporate environment, and it works completely different than all that cool stuff that you thought you knew how to do. Um, I don't want you, because this is what people often do, I don't want you to try to speak the language of each of those different back-end systems when you're pulling it all together, because it'll take you, the time to market is just huge, uh, and it's hard to maintain. So what I mean by that is, if you've got 10 different back-end systems, and they have 10 different APIs that work over different wire protocols and different languages and different everything, if you tried to write the spe specific code for each one to pull all, to aggregate that data together to then get out to devices, you'd be spending lots of time. We've got great stuff that'll help you do that so that you don't have to waste your time with that. You probably often think of things like BizTalk, but you can also think of things like SSIS, SQL Server Integration Services. You know, basically the gist of it, and when you think about all these MEEP solutions and MBAS solutions, one of the big selling points is these back-end adapters. That's like the big selling point. You know, you think it's all going to be on the mobile or the client side. No, it's how many adapters do you have to plug into back-end systems to make this easy. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm just going to focus on SSIS uh, because I'm going to leverage, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to leverage in-memory stuff in SQL 2014. And great thing is SSIS, you'd be amazed how many different backend things it connects to. And it's visual. I mean, we have this data tools. It runs in Visual Studio, and it's literally drag and drop this source to this destination. Microsoft already did all the hard work of translating the way this backend server Siebel or SAP or whatever it is or Dynamics to this. And so it's visual and you can do transformations, you know, kind of like ETL, uh, things like that. So there's kind of jumped ahead there. So it's visual. This is important because you need to rapidly connect these things. So you, instead of having a bunch of coders writing specific code for 20 different backend systems, you're going to train people one time to use a visual tool that you probably already already own, but you just may not know it to drag and drop and get stuff. Because what I'm going to do is my mobile middleware is going to be based around SQL Server and IIS. Big surprise. Uh, and we're going to aggregate that data in staging tables on SQL Server. And this is where the magic of these in-memory tables is really going to come to life for us. So this is kind of where we are now in a visual representation. As SSIS adapters talk to all these things for me uh, to do that whole EAI type stuff. And I'm going to pull them into different staging tables. You know, might have, you know, from a CRM system, all of customers, 
that I'm pulling in from an ERP. I might have products, and I'm going to aggregate all these together. But I want it to be super fast, because I'm all about speed. And then this kind of gives you an indication. This is just a quick, short list of the different types of back-end systems that you can connect to with SSIS. So you are by no means limited at all. Uh, and, and you can imagine, just with things like ODBC or ADO.net or whatever, OLADB, think about the zillions of databases that maybe I don't even have listed on here that you can talk to. But being able to interface with the native APIs is also an important thing. And so you absolutely have that here. Or it has HTTP or things like that. You know, if maybe I need to interface with Salesforce.com, pull some data in there, pull something else, integrate there. So it's kind of this enterprise way of integrating with these things versus kind of your consumer mashups. So what am I doing? I'm going to use SQL 2014 as a server facade in front of all this stuff back here. Because I need to talk a thousand different languages, pull together, but I also need to provide performance and scalability to these back-end systems that may be wholly unprepared to do that on their own uh, in, in the face of thousands or maybe millions of mobile devices. And so I'm going to let SQL Server 2014 take the big hits and the onslaught uh, from all these mobile devices and protect all these back-end systems from being hit directly. So I'm going to be pulling stuff in an orderly, calm fashion from these back-end systems, putting them in, in memory staging tables, and letting SQL Server uh, be, be that kind of scalable performance system. So what are some of the benefits? With Basically, we we're talking about these new in-memory tables. You know, so we've, we've got, we're off a disk. And I know things got a whole lot better with SSDs. And I absolutely, whenever you're deploying any kind of server, please use SSDs. It's just it's like magic, you know? Uh, why wouldn't you? But then getting off of there and really using all the cheap RAM that we have today, you know, obviously your latency, all that, all that stuff, all that time to disk, all that other stuff just kind of goes away. You're getting out of disk-bound I.O. And so things are coming back super, super fast. We didn't just take our existing database technology and just say, hey, it's in RAM. If we did, that would still be awesome. But we also did some other things. Uh, and so all this, thing, all this stuff to eliminate contention, uh, you know, all the locks and latches and stuff like that, we've totally reworked how all that works. And no, you're not, you know, we, we did some stuff uh, with a, the, kind of a uh, snapshot isolation in the past, you know, where we beat up on tempdb and you do row versioning kind of stuff like with normal databases. It's not even, it's kind of like that, but it's like the next gen of that. We're not even touching tempdb either. And so really free movements, not lots of locking to do what we need to do. But you're not going to have to worry about getting out of, out of in a, you know, a bad state. You know, you're always going to have that durability. So disk I.O. reduction, obviously, because we have, and I'll talk about the different types of data durability, because you might be asking yourself, well, if all this stuff's in RAM, that's awesome. But what if the thing crashes, or what if something goes wrong? How do I know I've got my data saved? So I'll talk about that in a second. Here's the great thing. It's just extreme performance. I've talked to folks, you know, we have, uh, we have these early adopter TAP programs, and we've had lots of customers. This is all anecdotal from different customers who've upgraded from past versions of SQL, like 2008, 2012. And just with all the changes we made in the core of the system, they got 2x performance boost. And for most CIOs, that was quite, wow, that was totally worth it. That, done. Great. But then when you start migrating these tables to in-memory tables, all, all of a sudden if they say, wow, you might get to 25 times faster, this is a huge game changer for any business. Because if the database is the heart of any system you built, you just made all your apps and everything that your customers use and the employees, everything just got a whole lot faster. Remember, use, don't confuse user experience with user interface UI stuff on the device. User experience is how long does it take for me to interact with backend systems and get data? When I hit that button, does it all come back really fast or am I waiting a long time? And remember, we're always contending with wireless data networks, so we're already kind of up against it anyway. So give it all the help you can. So this incredible performance boost uh, is just amazing. So. I'm just going to, I've got some slides here with some screenshots so you can kind of just quickly see, quick and dirty, how you might quickly build an in-memory table. Uh, so we'll just blaze through this really quick. Uh, if, you, if you do work with SQL Server, some of you might, this might look strange to you. But anyway, you're just going to start off by creating a new database like you normally would. Nothing special there. But then you've got this, you've got the, the, these file groups ideas here. And so there's this new feature 
If you look down here in memory optimized data at the bottom, this is kind of memory optimized data file group. So you're going to add that file group in after you've created just the initial database. Then the next thing is you've got this file stream data type that you're going to add in. Um, and it's really just that simple. I, I go to robtiffany.com. I have a blog post that just walks you through how to do this up and running. So you can quickly build in-memory tables really fast and start checking them out for yourself. So the tables themselves. Here's the other thing. SQL 2014 doesn't require the whole database to run in RAM. You, you do it on a table-by-table -table basis. You can choose to have old-style tables because you're, maybe you're doing a migration and you just want to do one table at a time. Uh, you may not feel the need to have everything in RAM. So you get to choose. So it's just at a table basis. So when you're creating new tables, right now we don't have super, we don't have all the tooling built out to visually create these tables. You get a starter SQL script, but I'll show you what a script looks like. Um, but you know, it's kind of like your typical create table, you know, except you'll have this, you know, keywords like memory optimized is on. I talked about du durability. So when, in this case, I'm talking about using it as staging tables because I'm passing through back-end systems, and this is just kind of a holding place for a moment in SQL Server. So I'm not as worried about durability here. So I can say schema only, which basically means I'm not going to be writing, I'm not going to do any transaction logging or I.O. on that on a background thread. I'm just going to leave it alone. And I know if the database crashes, I'll lose that. When it starts up again, you'll still get, they'll still rebuild the schema, but the data won't be there. But since it's a staging table, I'm not as worried. If I'm doing for just standard tables, I want to build my whole new, brand new transactional system, then I would say schema and data. And so you get, then you have options there. It'll, it'll write those transactions to logs in the background. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a quick view of what the, a create table looks like. No identity columns. That might be a bummer for some of you who love those. So in this case, I'm using uh, GUIDs. Um, Things are a little weird, and I'm not going to go too much in detail because I don't want this to become a SQL Server session because I want to keep moving on past this. Uh, but the, the idea of this non-clustered hash for your primary key, there's like literally in-memory hash tables, this weird thing, what's this bucket count? That's, that's new. It's basically all the buckets and hash tables. Basically, whatever you think the total number of primary keys you might have in the future, kind of just double that amount or whatever. You'll use more RAM, but if you, if you do too low of an amount on bucket count, it could hurt performance. But the key takeaway is just memory optimized on. You set the durability, and you go from there. And so in this situation, just like in my session yesterday, I wanted to kind of have apples to apples comparison with two different ways of doing the same thing. So I've got customers, I've got a product table, and I've got an order table. Now here's the next part of the cool stuff. We changed stored procs. Maybe you haven't built stored procs anymore or in a long time, and you started using, you know, you know, things like uh, Entity Framework or other, other technologies, Spring, Hibernate, whatever. Well, we have these new native compiled stored procedures that might bring you back home to doing that again because it's not just the same old T SQL. They literally, we have the C++ compiler in there, and they literally get compiled to C DLLs, and they run in RAM. And so, uh, you know, you can imagine when you have native machine code, you know, you're, not, you're using less CPU and less RAM and things like that than you would otherwise with just normal T SQLs type scripting. So you combine this native machine code within memory and you've really got a rocket ship. Here's just a quick example of what a native stored proc might look like. And so the, the, you know, the key difference is, you know, you, you do create procedure and all that, but you'll just add in with native compilation. Schema binding, all that means is, hey, whatever whatever uh, table that this store proc is connected to, don't let the person drop it or get rid of it because there's kind of a, a tie into there. And then you just have a, you have to you have a single kind of begin in on the atomic area there for your isolation level being snapshot. So it's actually pretty simple. There's not that much difference. And these are just some of the store procs we'll use for this session for selecting. And then this one will insert the order here. So let's move on to APIs now. So you might have heard there's like this big API com com economy. You know, people are plugging APIs into everything, which is great. People are not only doing APIs to expose systems out to the world, but companies are wrapping APIs around all the processes they do in between different divisions and employees and stuff like that, and finding there's a lot of value in that. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. When I think about mobile, though, let's go back to making sure we don't create a blocker for anything. 
so always use multi-channel transports. Multi-channel means it works through everything, uh, not proprietary things, uh, and, and data formats. That's kind of back to that like REST and JSON versus maybe some kind of binary protocol, which may be faster, but only works with these two systems, right? Um, so REST is pretty much, you know, we've been doing this SOAP thing for a long time, and then REST came out of nowhere and put, I'm not going to say it put SOAP out of its misery, but just kind of did. You know, everybody's, you know, there's still SOAP, lots of SOA systems out there using SOAP and XML, but the rest just kind of came along. It was more grassroots. JSON, something from the JavaScript engine in your web browser. It's just a smaller way to serialize data than using XML. It's really just that simple. You're just trying to make something smaller. And then using gzip deflate, how to compress this. Everybody uses the same stuff. So these three things... Use those to make, because you want to make things you're thoughtful about the user experience, right? So I've got super speed on the back-end database, and I'm making the way I send the data as tiny as possible, because I've got all these other choices, and because I know you might find yourself in the middle of nowhere going over GPRS, and it's going to matter that you were thoughtful about your wire protocol. So then you build an API tier, you know, that's kind of sitting out there. This is kind of like your web farms or stuff like that. And, and so in some cases, you're going to do, like I said, with SQL Server as a server facade, and you'll just talk to it directly. Sometimes you might have back-end systems that can handle the load, and maybe they have a simple API, and you might just translate the, their back-end APIs to your mobile-friendly ones, just using the web API. You're going to use the you know, business objects, you know, kind of these mobile business objects that you'll use that will map to tables, right? And you'll hydrate those objects, and then we're going to serialize those as JSON and send it over the wire, less, right? Um, the other thing is, is um, especially kind of yesterday, I was talking about sync and prefetching the idea, prefetching instead of being chatty and always asking for lots of stuff. You never know when you're going to lose connectivity. So do coarser grain collections and prefetch those collections as JSON in advance so that you've got what you need for the most part, you know, when you're out on the road, you know, instead of lots of tiny little fine grain API calls. And then performance, Cache, cache, cache. So we got a super fast database, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't cache at your web API tier as well. So I, I believe in caching everywhere, cache at every tier, you know, do whatever you can, memory's cheap, make it fast. Uh, you have a lot of different options that you can see here. We have the standard kind of, we used to have a one, uh, caching thing, it was just an ASP.NET only, now we've made it, it just works across all .NET, it's just called memory cache. But you can also use the Azure cache, kind of you think of that like memcache, distributed cache, right? Or you think of Redis or stuff like that. And then we have App Fabric caching on-prem with your Windows servers. So absolutely cache. Of course, you're going to load balance. You've been doing that forever, uh, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud. And then when you're in the cloud, take advantage of Traffic Manager with Azure. So you can bounce around different regions of the globe uh, as appropriate for your end user or also is appropriate for when, if something goes down, you know. So we're going to have little data, little models. And so I'm going to have a customer table that you saw me create, and so I'm going to have a customer model that looks just like that. So just a little simple POCO, kind of similar to what I showed you yesterday with uh, working with SQLite. Uh, you can have services. I'll talk to this more in a second, because, you know, web API is kind of based on the whole MVC stuff in web API, you know, uh, ASP.NET. And so you've got controllers and all that fun stuff. I'm going to show you something about, it's, called, it's a pattern called the repository pattern. We'll just geek out there just for a second, you know, uh, as far as how you should get your data so that you don't tightly bind stuff in the wrong place. <clears throat> so web API, you're going to create a controller, you know, when you're creating web API in Visual Studio. Um, Obviously, we have it where it can work within any framework. In my case, I'm just going to do some kind of bare bones ones because uh, I'm just going to do plain old REST and JSON. You're going to name that controller. A lot of times, it'll name it for you. In this case, we're getting a customer controller, and you've got to do that in order to communicate. Uh, and so this is kind of what a controller looks like. And I'll show you in the code here in a second. The key difference, you'll see lots of examples oftentimes where right in the controller, someone will write all the code to talk to the any framework right there or talk to the database or whatever right there. I just want to make you, you know, follow this little simple pattern where I, I don't want you to end up, you know, because if you have to change data sources, you know the deal. You don't want to have to rip out code and stuff like that. So this repository pattern, you'll, you'll use that to make the calls rather than, because by default, you'll see scaffolding with all the gets, puts, deletes, all that kind of stuff right in the controller. I want you to pull that out of there because you need to be flexible 
if you make changes, right? And so in the end, you will have your API tier of servers that are load balanced and cached hitting these in-memory staging tables via native stored procs. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So let's take a look at it. All right. Um, first thing I'll show you is just, this is just a SQL server, a SQL server. You know, you can see here I got customer table, order table, product. But these are just all in memory. And you can just kind of see what I have in here. If you session yesterday, it's the exact same data as I was doing with SQLite and Azure Mobile Services. Um, so nothing, nothing strange, nothing weird training you have to learn. So the cool thing about the web API is that you can test it before you build the client. So I've got my web API code here. And, and uh, you know, so like uh, you can see here on the right, I've got controllers, I've got models, and I've got services. So, you know, there's a customer model that's going to map to that customer staging table. A product's going to map, you know, just like you might expect. Um, and then, you know, the controllers, you know, customer controllers. So the controller is the entry point for the RESTful API call. Uh, for the URI that's coming in here. But what you can see is I'm going to instantiate this repository over here, uh, you know, in the constructor, and I'm going to make my call, because in this case, I just want to get all the customers, but I'm going to call it over in the repository. So I've got this little services folder. And so the customer repository is here. And, uh, you know, actually the best way to teach you this, just like yesterday, is, is we're going to debug. Uh, and what you're going to see here, this is an example of I'm going to call get all customers from an in-memory table. I'm going to return a generic list of customers. I'm going to, it'll, but luckily, Web API automatically serializes that for JSON for me, so that's great. Uh, but I'm also going to show you how to use some caching uh, as well. And so you can see how you get performance. And so uh, and it's just standard ADO.NET calling a native stored proc. So let's let's just test it out. And here's the great thing is is you can build your whole API suite before you've even written a line of code on any client app for, for Windows or iOS or anything, uh, which is great because you can fully test and, and feel good about your APIs. So it's easy enough. I just hit API. In this case, I'm going to hit customer and hit return, and it hits my breakpoint. So I've already gone into my repository there, and I'm get all customers. And so let's just kind of let's kind of debug through here. So right away, I'm going to set up this memory cache because I'm going to use it. You know, how to expire your cache, that's up to you based on the data. Right now, I'm just going to do 30 seconds just for an example. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check, hey, is there a list of customers by chance already sitting in cache? Because you know what? The fastest SQL query I can make is the one I don't have to make, right? Because it's already in RAM waiting for me. And then I'm faster and more scalable. And if it's not there, then I'm going to keep trucking along create this cache policy, and then here we're going to get something that looks familiar. You, I'm going to grab a connection string, because we're going to just do some familiar SQL stuff. I'm going to create a command off the connection. I'm going to open the connection. I'm going to say, hey, I'm doing a stored proc. And there's the text. It's customer select. But this is that native machine code stored proc, so it's going to be rocking fast. And then I'm going to just do that same old data reader we've used for a million years, right? Make sure there, it's not equal to null. Make sure there actually has rows. Then I'm going to create, I've got that customer object. I want to fill that customer object. And then also I want to have a generic list of customer objects that I want to fill with data, because I'm going to fling that back to my mobile client. So I instantiate that, start reading, create a new customer object. You know, And you can see how simple this is. I purposely made this simple. It's just an ID, first name, and last name. And then I add the customer to the list. So let's use our fun tool tips. And sure enough, there's, there's one of our customers. And then if I just keep hitting, I won't bore you with this too much, but as we build this, you can see that the list keeps growing, the generic list. And you can see the count, and I can look at any one of them. And sure enough, it's, it's really working. And then I'll just hit Continue, and it's going to send the answer back. But since it's not XML, it's not going to render right in, in the IE. It's, it's JSON. And you can see, look, it's only 346 bytes. That's kind of small. I, of course, I'm not getting a lot of data. And then when I say, let me see that, you can see it in Visual Studio. Uh, and sure enough, this is the return value, that GUID, first name, last name, that kind of thing. And again, I'm, I'm using JSON because it's smaller than the XML equivalent. Now, let's get the cache to work. 
I may have goofed around here too long for it to kick in yet, but let's just double check. Let's see. All right. I'm going to blow through this really fast. Yep, there's that. Now let's do it again and see the cache take effect. So this time I'm stepping through. And this time, boom, hey, the answer is in RAM. And now I'm just going to return the answer directly. And so, you know, sure enough, there it is. And so, anyway, caching is your friend. It's all good. So that's kind of the takeaway on the web API side. So let's go back to eight. It's good to get data out, but make sure it's secure. <laughs> um, so anyway, I won't spend too much time on this, but there's the idea of a mobile access gateway. If you're building this whole system in the cloud, it just works, right? But if you're building it on-prem in your company's data center, you've got to be able to publish that data out. It doesn't just go out. Um, so anyway, you may in the past have used, like anybody who's got Exchange Server set up in their company, you've been using things in the past like ISA Server or UAG or things like that, or some other reverse proxy. So the cool thing is, is recently, last fall, we uh, kind of the blue wave of servers, Windows Server 2012 R2, we, we built in that thing called Web Application Proxy to do exactly that, that just securely publish back-end services. So like you've got to, you need to map it to a virtual directory on IIS to publish it out to the internet where people can get that securely, you know, so without requiring people to like set up a VPN tunnel or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of takeaway. So kind of, kind of similar pattern that a jillion people use all over the planet to get Exchange email on every device imaginable. Uh, sits in the DMZ between your back and front firewalls. I'm not going to get into that because I know I talk to different security people and they go just totally medieval on me on the different ways that you should be setting all that stuff up. But that's kind of the key takeaway there. Uh, works with ADFS, can do claims-based authentication or the good old Kerberos that we've been using forever. And then, yeah, it just maps that external URL to an internal URL for a virtual directory. And that's how you, and you know what? I've used this for so long because all the old merge replication sync and it used IIS with a little server agent to sync with pocket PCs and Windows mobile devices use this exact same pattern to do that. So nothing new here. So that's how you get the data out security, securely. And so now you see down here at the bottom, you, you know, and you can cluster these gateways, you know, in case there's a whole bunch of people hitting this data. And they're just touching, you know, you, you got the, NLB that you're pointing, uh, cluster virtual IP you point to, to hit your, your API tier. So somebody at the keynote the other night said, data's the new oil, and it's gonna sound like I copied this from him, but really, I already had this, but you, for real. Um, I was just trying to be clever. But, uh, but it's right, there's so much value to data, but to get data, you're gonna need APIs, right? That's, that's, that's that you got to facilitate that, and then you're going to see the data with your all kinds of devices, right? And so these are kind of the things you need all together, and so that's why this whole API thing is exploding right now. This is how to how to get at all this data. I need to build APIs. I'm not going to build some monolithic tool to get it. I'm going to set it free or lock it down or by role or whatever. So we got to talk to it. How do I consume this data? APIs. So we're now we're in our universal app land here. And so we have the WinRT HTTP client. So let's geek out. We're going to use that to call these RESTful APIs. So this is not going to be like anybody who's worked in the last decade or more where we have a ASPX or ASMX or, you know, the different web services, and you can right-click on the service and create a proxy. You're going to use this to call these RESTful APIs, whether it's us or RESTful APIs from somebody else. Out of the box, it supports the decompression and compression because that's, Part of the whole thing is we want to keep things small because we are thoughtful of the user and we know we're all running on wireless data networks and some are 4G and some are miserable. Um, and we're going to download that JSON that the web API just magically it serialized it for you. You didn't have to do anything. It just turned it into JSON. And we're going to deserialize it when we catch that data on the client side when we download it. We're going to deserialize that and turn that into a collection of objects, kind of like that generic list you saw me build on the server side. I'm just going to do the reverse of that. 
And then, in, and then in, on the flip side, when I'm creating new data, I'll add to collections and I'll serialize it and send it back up. So I have a feeling that we're going to see another picture. So at this point now, you're just down at the mobile devices going through wireless data networks, and you don't care about anything back there, and you're just hitting the virtual IP on those mobile access, those gateways. This is the other thing. This other kind of, it might seem redundant, but this is also a reminder, like lots of software projects, that you can have totally different people working on different parts of your project. I know that's kind of duh, but you know your mobile developers don't have to know anything about API development, and the API guys don't have to know anything about database development, and the database guys don't have to know anything about ETL adapters talking to backend systems. So you don't all have to know everything about everything. Thank God for that, huh? Um, all right, so I still have my web API. I've got a couple of instances of Visual Studio, so I still have it running here, so I can debug through that if I wanted to. So let's look at the app. So I've got a universal app here. If you look on the right, all the usual suspects are here. I have the Windows 8.1 version. I've got the Windows Phone version project, and I've got the shared stuff. And sure enough, look at that. You know, I've got models down here, just like I had on the server, and there's customer. Because remember, I've got to cast that data into an object, right? So, and it seems like, wow, you had to build that yourself. What a pain. But you know, that's what, that's what those proxies did for you when you created a, a service you know, for calling SOAP. You know, behind the scenes, it just did the exact same thing. Luckily, it's not too big a deal. Um, and so I've got that. I've, uh, I've created an API client class that's shared between both projects. <coughs> Um, you know, if I look at it, you know, I'm going to call my local host here for my web APIs, and I've got this clever HTTP client handler here, which you, you use in advance of just the normal HTTP client, and because of that, because it can detect if your device and, and the stream supports decompression, and if it does, then it'll use it. And you can scroll over here, and sure enough, yep, I'm going to use gzip, and I'm going to use deflate. So that's good. And then we just got a few tasks. You know, I'm going to download products you know, with my HTTP response, and I'm going to deserialize that. In this case, I'm using just the built-in data contract JSON serializer, but you can use the stuff for Newtonsoft as well if you want to. And so I'm deserializing that stream of JSON coming at me of type a generic list of products, in this case, uh, you know, or customers or whatever, just the reverse of what you saw. And so basically, I'm just deserializing and putting them in memory, and then here's the same exact thing for customers. And then here's, it's a little smaller and different for uploading orders. I'm going to create an order object locally, and I'm going to serialize that as JSON string to send it on its way. And I've got a little serialized helper here. I also have this other giant thing here called table storage class. So basically, and I won't, we'll debug through a lot of this, but kind of like yesterday, I kind of talked about DDL and DML. So DDL, I'm creating my table. So here I'm defining my generic lists of customer orders and products tables. Um, I'm going to instantiate them. And then I've got lots of methods uh, where I'll go through a lot of the CRUD stuff, upload, download, and saving offline, because obviously serializing offline is one of the key elements, right? Because it needs to keep working. You need to be able to reboot your device, and the data is still, still there. So let's start off here and just fire it up in Windows Phone emulator. And so you can see here, I've got stuff to call my web APIs, download, real simple, just a couple downloads and an upload. Uh, and you also see here, I've got an area where I can work with data. And again, this is very similar to what I did yesterday with SQLite, except this time we're going to use NoSQL in memory collections instead. Um, so let's just do the web APIs from the phone, and I'll do the CRUD stuff from the tablet. Uh, so let's just walk through downloading products. So I'm going to call into that web API client that I built. Uh, and ultimately, I want to return a list of products. right? So let's hit F11. We're going to go in there. And look at that. We just instantly, you probably didn't notice that we just instantly switched to the other version of Visual Studio that was already debugging, the API thing, if you look at the top. And so you see right away, we're hitting the server-side code. So you've seen this before, so I don't need to bore you with that. So we'll let it run. And sure enough, it comes back. We deserialize it, and then we return it. And of course, you know, I've got to prove it to you. So when we do our fun tool tips, and sure enough, we now have pulled back four different products. And sure enough, those are some products, you know, graphics card, hard drives, stuff like that. 
and then the the same and you know you can download customers, but it's exactly the same. And so again, you see I'm hitting the customer side. So again, you know, if I'm hitting this a lot and I have a lot of people, you know, I'll be hitting cached versions of that, and so it gets a whole lot faster. Um, so that's kind of a quick gist of some uploading download. Really simple boilerplate code that you use to call these REST services. So, uh, so it's, it's not a big deal. So let's just go ahead and kill this. And so now, I think the next thing I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll set the tablet up to be the startup project. Let's, uh, let's move back over to the slides for a sec. All right, so we consumed API data. So now we need to work offline. Now that data is on board our device, we've got to work with it offline. And, uh, and the cool thing is, I'm going to show you NoSQL object collections, but you could absolutely substitute by hand the stuff I showed you yesterday using SQLite if you want. You know? and, and the guidance here is it has to do with how much data you're talking about. You know, if you're talking about just tons, of huge amounts of data, then you might want to use a SQLite database because it's going to be more capable of ha handling larger volumes of data on the device versus these collections of objects. Um, so anyway, keep working while there's no connectivity. You're going to be able to create tables. And you're going to use Link to query those in-memory object collections. That's the whole great thing about language integrated query is we can query collections using something that looks like SQL. And that's what we're doing because we're turning JSON into in-memory collections. Oh my gosh, I just built an in-memory database, and we just called an in-memory database on the server side from SQL 2014. So we are just staying in memory the whole time. Um, insert, update, delete, selects, you know, make it real. Uh, multi-table joins, like I showed you yesterday, I'll show you some ridiculous way to do multi-table join against three collections in RAM to show that that's real. Uh, and then, of course, most importantly, save it offline. Uh, so that the device can crash, the device can reboot, whatever, run out of battery, and you're, you're still in good shape. So let's take a look at the cruddy stuff of offline data. So I'm going to fire up the simulator now for <laughs> Windows 8.1. And you know, here's kind of the version of the same stuff, calling Web API. So in this case, I'm just going to hard code some inserts uh, just to play with here. So if I hit insert here, I'll just step through one of these. I'll show you what it looks like inserting customers into this in-memory collection. This is assuming I hadn't pre-downloaded this. This is assuming I've got nothing and I'm creating it from scratch here. And so as I go there, I'm basically taking that customer list and then adding, you know, newing up a customer model object and putting in data you know, and I'm using WIDs because I know I'm using that back on the back end. And then right here, this save changes. So I did insert. Think of this in SQL way of is this as your auto commit. You know, this is me committing to disk right now when I do the insert. I could choose not to. I could I could commit to disk on a timer every 30 seconds or whatever you want to do. You know, because maybe if you want to, you know how it is when you're doing inserts in the database, if you you know, do a transaction so that you buffer it all up and then slam it all in one time. It's a lot faster than commit, 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 commit. Anyway, so let's go ahead and step through what state of changes looks like. Oh, I hit F10. So there's, we're going to insert products. Here's what save changes looks like. So I pass in a collection. There's my collection of products. In this case, I'm saying, hey, call this table. I'm just writing a file. It's a JSON file. And so I create the file, async, and, uh, and it does that for me and saves it. And then it's just as easy. And here's some dummy orders I've created. So anyway, select. I'm just going to call this method here to, and bind it to the item source of a, this customer list view. And so kind of like yesterday, just simple, it can be whatever you want, as complex or simple uh, link as you want. In this case, I'm just saying, give me everything. Give me all the products, and give me those orders, which, you know. And so here again, so now I've got my stuff, all my customers, my products, and those bad orders, and you'll get it if, when I get to it, just like I did yesterday. And so let's do some other CRUD operations. Let me show what it's like to delete one of those. We'll step into that. This is kind of what the link looks like when I want to delete. You know, basically, I'm just saying, hey, remove, 
removed from this collection where the ID is equal to that ugly GUID. I could have done something else, obviously. Uh, and then serialize that immediately uh, to disk. Um, let's take the breakpoint off of here, because that's going to get redundant. Kind of like I apologized yesterday, I'm not using MVVM in this example, so it's not data bound. I'm just refreshing each time so you can see what it looks like. Um, so I deleted one, I deleted myself. There's only Andy, Nick, and Martin left. If I want to delete all, clearing them from memory first, <coughs> clearing the disk version, the serialized version there, and getting all that out of there. All right, so let's reinsert, get stuff back in there again. And let's show you updates. So it's kind, I'm going to update one of, the re one of the records. So update one, I'm just saying, hey, update the record with this ugly GUID, which happens to be me in this case, and change my first name to Mike from Rob and serialize that. Do that auto commit. Select, and sure enough, I'm now Mike Tiffany. There I am. And then update all. I want to change everybody. And basically, this is simpler, and it's not even link. I just can iterate through that collection and change everybody's last name. I'm going to change it all to Satter in this case. And so everybody's last name has changed. So, so right there, again, seeing is believing. And so you know, I want it, uh, you know, for you to use this idea of in-memory collections that you can serialize, you've got to know that I can do, you can do the four CRUD operations. And we absolutely just did them. Inserts, selects, multiple updates, multiple deletes. So now. We have the bad order, kind of like I talked about yesterday. You know, you've got an order made up a bunch of GUIDs that the person, if the person's using a tablet and they're trying to do business, they don't understand what they're looking at at all. And so, because uh, it's a bunch of GUIDs, the first one is kind of like the, the ID for the order, the next one's the ID for a person, and the last one's the ID for products. So we've got to make that look a lot nicer. So let's do a, a multi table join against in memory collections. And so, Again, it's all it's all link. I'm just doing a, a query against orders, you know, and then I'm going to start. I'm going to ultimately shoot out to kind of a, a projection, a view of what it looks like. So, as you can imagine, on the orders, customers where order ID is equal to the customer ID, and the same thing with products. And then you're going to at the very bottom here, you kind of project out the order ID, the first name, last name. So if I just hit continue. Sure enough, you still, we're still using ugly GUIDs for the primary key, but everything else looks like you might expect. And so the last thing we got to do is, so we've done all our CRUD stuff. We've done multi-table joins, so this can look friendly for your users. But we've got to make it real, so let's upload this order we just created, OK? So in this case, I'm going to say, hey, do I got any orders in that list? I sure do. So let's go into that upload orders. Method. Sure enough, here's the order. You can see there it is in its beautiful goodness. And then I'm going to serialize that as a JSON string, set the some content properties, and then I'm going to call out. And look, sure enough, now I'm in the other instance of Visual Studio Debugger, and I've called to the REST service. Yes, that's what I expected it to get. I'm going to step into the repository pattern. Get my connection string, and we're just going to do ADO.NX. I'm going to call the native stored proc for insert. So we're just doing an insert, you know, grabbing all the, the values, you know, doing a parameterized query, because that's best practice, right, instead of me just building some giant string, right? Um, so I'm going to put that in there, execute the query. Hope it all works out. And we're done. Of course, you're not done until you look at the database. So here's the orders. So let's refresh that. And sure enough, there's our new order that goes in there. And so we did our total round trip. Memory native stored procs, memory web APIs, memory database on the device, big in-memory theme, speed, scalability. And so in the end, you know, look what you built. You built this thing. <laughs> Um, anyway, obviously, like I said, there's lots of ways to approach these problems. This is just one way. 
but it's a, it's a great way to use the, especially on that back end, to provide that speed and scalability that some of these back end systems may not have. Uh, and you might want to do some other things, like scale out your data tier, and sharding and stuff like that. I didn't talk about doing that. The great thing, too, one of the features when we uh, talk about the in memory capabilities in SQL 2014 is, you know, some of the stuff I read, it's often roughly equivalent to have you know, scaled out maybe five or ten other SQL servers, just the performance you get because you're not hitting disks anymore and things like that, and you don't have those latches. And so, uh, so anyway, dramatic performance improvements. Uh, you can build some pretty big servers, lots of RAMs, and you can do this in IS too. You can absolutely, you know, if you get a bigger VM with lots of RAM, put SQL 2014 in there. We've got lots of guidance on the web to talk to you about how you can do that if you would like to do that versus Azure SQL Database, because uh, it's going to give you the in-memory stuff that Azure SQL Database isn't doing today. And so there you go. You built this cool thing, and we are all done. Uh, I really appreciate you coming and spending some time. We've got some great, uh, really interested, this document DB, that, that looks like that's going to be a great session there, because uh, it's kind of along the lines of what are the different ways we're doing scalable databases on the back end to really scale out and give you great performance for all these mobile devices. So that, that looks like a good one. Uh, lots of resources you've seen already. And please, please, please submit your evaluation. And so now I have a few minutes to ask some questions, answer some questions, and then I'm going to go fly to Queenstown because I heard it just totally rocks down there. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time.